Thank you. So a warm welcome to each and every one of you who are taking part in this uh, webinar, uh, Friday the 6th of March 2020. This is a webinar hosted by EDEN, the European Distance and E-Learning Network. And we used to take part in the Open Education Week uh, every year. Uh, I think we have done it for some four years by now at least. And we used to have one uh, webinar uh, each day. So I had the honor and pleasure to host the, the last day uh, for the Open Education Week hosted by Eden. And it's a great pleasure to be here together with my co-presenters and also together with the Eden Secretariat and also being together with all of you who are taking part in this uh, webinar. And I see that people are still coming in and um, you are warmly welcome. Um, we have this system by Eden that when you take part in um, webinars like this one, you get also a badge. So that's important why you need to register. And if you haven't done so, please do that and you will get an open badge to collect uh, for your merits for taking part in um, both formal and informal learning opportunities. And for those of you who are presenters, you get also a badge, of course, uh, but a, a presenter badge. <clears throat> so today's topic is about microlearning and quality for lifelong learning in the digital age. And I will be your moderator for this session, but I will also present myself. And um, I'm a professor in uh, Innovation in Open Online Learning, and I'm also um, in Eden in the Faculty Committee. And I'm also in the Eden Council of Fellows. And I also share the, the EDAN uh, special interest group about quality in um, uh, technology-enabled learning. And I'm also uh, in, e in ICD, EC. ICD is the International Council for Distance and uh, Open Distance Education. <laughs> and I'm in the EC there, and I'm sharing also the uh, ICD, uh, OER, Open Education Resources Advocacy Committee. Uh, I'm based in Sweden, and uh, I'm also the president, uh, vice president of the Swedish Associations for Distance Education. Uh, this webinar will be recorded, so you will get the link afterwards uh, to um, look at it again, and um, the presentations will be there, and you can also welcome to share it with your colleagues and fellows. And in case uh, you are um, talking about this webinar during we are going on, uh, please uh, use the hashtag. And maybe you can provide that for us in the chat, Dora, how to use the hashtags. Thank you so much. So please rem remember to use the hashtags in case you are letting other people in who are not just here in the room with us. Maybe they would like to take part in our conversation or to social media, and they are most welcome to do so. We have a very, very interesting um, uh, session today about microlearning, which really, really is a hot topic for many reasons, although it has been around for many, many years, and we will go through it uh, during this webinar. We have four presenters. It's Professor Badr Khan. It is uh, Professor Josef René Kobe and Professor uh, Maria Elena Kobe and myself. And on the side here, you have also the contact details for all of us. And it is, in, as you saw, in the program as well. Uh, Dr. Badr Khan, he will uh, uh, be in our webinar uh, with, uh, from a video he has done for us. So he will not be here in present in, um, in the photos. So you cannot see him there. But he, he is together with us. And he has sent his regards to each and every one of you, of, you, of course. So first, I would like to say something very short about EDEN. EDEN is the European Distance and E-Learning Network, and it's the largest active and developing professional community of researchers and practitioners of open distance and e-learning in Europe. Although it is a European network, we have many um, participants 
um, at our conferences, for example, but also as members from other uh, places around in the world, and we are very, very happy and pleased for that. It is the most comprehensive European non-for-profit, non-governmental association of its kind, and it was established in 1991. So we are almost 30 years old, and in summer we will celebrate our 29th annual conference in Romania. My last slide for this webinar is about that. It is a platform for, for professional cooperation and information exchange. It's open for all levels of sectors of education, so from K-12 to higher education, non-formal and informal learning, private organizations. So it is a very broad network, and you can really find um, people and projects of interest if you join uh, us with Eden. You can do that as an institution or as an individual member. Um, and also for networks, for, of course. Uh, we are registered in the UK, but we have our secretariat in Hungary since 1997. And we have at least uh, three persons from the secretariat here at our, at our webinar. It is Dora, it is um, Linda, and it is uh, Gabor. So thank you very much again for being with us. Uh, we have also a special interest group, as I briefly mentioned. I am the chair of the Eden Special Interest Group on Technology Enabled Learning, TEL, and Quality Enhancement. And we are a network for people who are interested in this uh, topic. And microlearning is, of course, one of the topics which is uh, very highly uh, of interest uh, with this group as well. We have also a uh, uh, NAP uh, committee and a NAP organization. It's a network of uh, um, practitioners within the area of e-learning and open online learning. So the topic for today is about micro-learning, and that is a very hot topic for the moment due to many reasons. First of all, to the rise of technology, but also about the personalized mobile learning to bite-sized learning snippets. And of course, the global challenges with the rise of uh, digitalization, uh, use of internet, use of social media, the more change demography, people are moving around, and we cannot at least see the, the value of online uh, learning possibilities uh, with this uh, coronavirus, uh, which we are facing all of us around the world for the moment. Um, it's also a, a topic for lifelong learning and for lifelong learning, so people can learn throughout life uh, due to micro-learning and the um, uh, providing of, of, of um, good quality micro-learning. Um, Bite-sized um, learning possibilities uh, is considered as very successful and very attractive for learners because it is allow just for me and just for time learning and both for training, but also for, learn, for learning as such, and for achievement and uh, development in different kind of contexts. It is very cost effective, and it is meaningful for the learners. And there are many solutions for each uh, individual. So uh, for this webinar, we have uh, uh, invited experts. So we will have a conversation and discussion about this very, very interesting uh, topic to allow uh, quality learning possibilities for all in just for me and just for time, just in time. Um, you are all very welcome to raise, to raise the questions or issues or links uh, in the chat. And in the end of the presentation, we will um, take up um, those questions which you have raised and we will have a conversation. So we have plenty of time in the end to discuss. So you're very welcome to yeah, raise questions, um, whatever you like. And I saw that uh, Ian Dora has just uh, uh, remember, remember us again about to uh, register if you haven't done so. Then you get uh, the link for the webinar and you get also the badge. So with that, uh, a warm welcome again to each of you. <clears throat> and um, then I will uh, leave the floor to um, uh, my co-presenters, uh, Badrul Khan, uh, Josef René Cobain, and Maria Elena Cobain. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Eva. Uh, welcome to today's presentation or, or webinar. Uh, Dr. Badrul Khan, Dr. Maria Elena Corbe, and myself are working on a on a book right now that will be published in early 2021, uh, titled "Microlearning in the Digital Age: The Design and Delivery of Learning Snippets." And when we were pr preparing for this book, we we had several questions about what we we wanted to learn ourselves about microlearning, and we've been doing the research on that. So today's presentation. Uh, will involve uh, several questions that we thought were important that needed to be addressed in this book and that I think uh, would be an interesting conversation to have today. So with that, um, we'll go ahead and get started. My name is Joseph René Corbet and I'm a professor at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. I teach educational technology courses that are fully online uh, for the Master of Education in Educational Technology. Um, I've been teaching online for approximately 23 years. As a matter of fact, I was one of, uh, I developed one of the very first online courses for our university and for the UT system when it was developing its online telecampus. Marielena, you want to say a little bit? Hi, my name is Marielena Corbe. I am also a professor of educational technology at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. We are in the uh, tip of Texas at Brownsville, Texas. And the university is also in Edinburgh and Harlingen, Texas. I've been teaching and designing courses online for a little less, about 15 years. And uh, Rene and I both develop undergraduate masters and doctoral courses. Uh, we mentor faculty who are new to educational technology or teaching online, and uh, we're members of several professional organizations. We are new to Eden, but this will certainly not be our last time. So thank you for welcoming us. And then Dr. Khan, uh, he was actually my mentor uh, when I was going through the masters in educational technology. Uh, I was his research assistant when he was a very, very young professor. Uh, this was back in 1996, 1997. Uh, he was working on his very first book titled Web-Based Instruction, which became a global bestseller. And it pretty much launched his career, made him kind of the, the expert on web-based, on, I think it says on, on his website that he's, uh, recognized as uh, the expert on modern e-learning. So we've been collaborating and communicating over these 23 years, but more recently, within the last seven or eight years, Marielena and I have been working with him on several projects, including two published books and, and the third one, which we, we're working on right now. Um, and as Eva mentioned uh, Dr. Khan can't join us today because he's traveling uh, to another conference, as a matter of fact, but he did record an introduction and a welcome that we'd like to go ahead and, and uh, share with you at this time. Co-editors, Dr. Corbeis. Greetings to everyone. My name is Badrul Khan. Sorry I couldn't be with you today. Maybe I can join you later because I have another uh, schedule I have to go to. Um, so two of my co-editors, Dr. Corbeis, will be with you talking about microlearning. So microlearning, as you know, as the definition that we will show is a single uh, objective. And this has to be brief and it must be competency-based. So think about an umbrella. So an umbrella has so many spokes and each spoke of the umbrella could be, uh, could be an objective. And so this objective must be 
taught in a very micro learning way, very brief way. Three to five minutes is the maximum if you do a video snippets, learning snippets, which I call. So to create engaging uh, this brief competence-based micro learning based on a single learning objective, one has to follow some guidelines. So I created an e-learning framework, uh, which is basically looks like uh, in my bookshelf here. Uh, this is one of the book that we did, and this is the framework. So each micro learning must have these eight dimensions of Khan's e-learning framework, pedagogy, technology, interface design, management, evaluation, ethical consideration, etc. So each e-learning micro learning unit should follow this framework. So my colleagues will be talking about the framework so that each unit, each micro learning unit must be meaningful. The overall goal, the overall goal of the umbrella is to protect you from rain or sunshine. At the same time, each objectives, they are working toward the achieving the goal of your course. So they may have 40 objectives, but there is only one goal. So each objective deals with a specific task for the whole goal of the umbrella. So these are known as learning snippets. In fact, in um, 2007, I authored an article called Learning Snippets for Meaningful E-Learning Implementation. So you need to think about two things. One is informational, one is instructional. Informational about a camera, the description of camera is the information. But how to teach one to use, operate the camera is in instruction. So we are talking about micro learning. We are talking about, not talking about the information. We are talking about instruction that will lead to learning. So from the perspective in instructional design and my octagonal e-learning framework, this will be your focus for creating meaningful, usable, micro learning and uh, i hope to see you in another events in person or virtually thank you so much for watching So that's Dr. Khan. Um, we apologize for some of you that had difficulty hearing the, the audio. Um, but basically, he just gave a, a very, very brief overview of, of what we're going to be talking about today. So one of the first questions that, that we uh, tasked ourselves with is to try to figure out what exactly microlearning is. We've all heard the term. It's, it's actually the, a term that's been in use for uh, over 20 years. I think uh, now actually the the concept has been has existed longer than 20 years. Theo Hug in 2007 in his book Microdidactics of Microlearning was credited with coining the term microlearning. So 
the concept's been around for a very, very long time, but if you ask different people what it is, uh, they may not be able to come up with the same exact uh, definition, but there are several key words that we've noticed through the literature that seem to come up over and over again. And, and this uh, word cloud that I created represents some of those key words that we've come across. Uh, Microlearning is just in time, it's mobile, it's self-directed, it's self-paced, it's cost-effective, it's bite-sized, it's visual, it's short, it's accessible, and so on. You can see all the different terms. And we, one of the first tasks that we set about doing is to try to define microlearning for the context of our book. And this is the definition that we came up with. It is not the all, you know, comprehensive definition, but I think it's one that works for us and in the context of, of the, the scope and focus of our book. Uh, it's microlearning can be viewed as a single objective focused, outcome based, standalone, meaningful, and interactive learning unit delivered in bite sized snippets. And this could be a very short modular format either digitally, via computer, tablet, or mobile phone, or non-digitally, via a flashcard or booklet. And designing and delivering microlearning requires thoughtful analysis and investigation of how to use the learning media's potential in concert with instructional design principles and issues critical to various dimensions of the learning environment. So it's a long definition, but basically that that's how we're operationally defining it in, in our program. And so as we looked at topics that were up and coming, that as Rene and Eba shared earlier, microlearning's been around a long time. But a question we had is, is it here to stay? And the answer from the research we've done and talking to people you know, all over the world and many of our co-authors, the answer is a definitive yes. A report came out recently, and there are many reports online that uh, support this, but a, a report came out recently that says that the global microlearning market size is expected to grow from 1.5 billion U.S. dollars in 2019, which were 2020 now, to 2.7 billion in just five years, now four years, um, you know, growing at almost 15% in that time period. And so why the demand for microlearning? We really wanted to know if it was a trend or strategy that was here to stay. And we found some of the things that Eva highlighted in that first slide that she showcased for us. There's increased demand in education, in corporate, medical, military, um, and all different professions for the training of deskless. And I found that term to be really interesting because we've talked about learners and workers as being mobile but they're also deskless. So that means a mobile learner I kind of thought of was a person who had a desk, right, went to somewhere, even in, at home, and then moved around to different places or met with people from different places. But now they're talking about deskless workers and across industries. And there's a growing need for skills-based and results-oriented. And this is what Dr. Khan highlighted, meaningful bits of uh, learning opportunities uh, in different enterprises. And so we found um, the PR Newswire in 2019 says that microlearning empowers enterprises to offer results-oriented training. And while e-learning and MOOCs and different strategies that are currently out there, online courses, are results-oriented, what's different here is that and we'll showcase this throughout our presentation, that it's meaningful, it's quick, and it's um, learner-centered. Um, so the, it enables learners to understand and implementing the learning for their jobs much more easily. So why is micro-learning growing? It provides learning opportunities for mobile employees as well as those who are um, kind of stuck to their desks or at a factory or in a learning environment. And it 
provides companies and educational institutions to provide centralized learning solutions for employees and other partners. Because now more and more, we're having to educate people about the products we're selling. Even those of us in higher education are selling a product. We're selling a degree. We're selling um, you know, upward mobility for our learners. And it's flexible. Uh, and it can enhance the learning experience. But how is that different from any other e-learning solution or any course that's out there that we have, can have access to? Businesses are adopting training methods that are directly inclined towards a learning objective. Remember the spokes of that umbrella that Dr. Khan talked about? Um, they focus, micro-learning focuses on a specific skill, sometimes just one or two, and that's what makes it efficient for learners and helps for learners who are on the go or have very little time or need to focus on a specific skill. And as we look at the characteristics of learners today, no matter what industry they're in, uh, Greeny did a study. She found that the modern learner is overwhelmed and distracted. And if we think of the definitions of microlearning that we've seen today or that you know in the practice of your own profession, um, they're short, right? And they're engaging. And we'll talk about characteristics of effective microlearning in just a few minutes. So if, our, if the modern learner is overwhelmed and distracted and look at the time they spend on different activities, then micro-learning objects and solutions, we could see why they're growing today. And learners turn to their phones. They check their phones 10 times in one hour. And I think that's low. I think it's probably even more. And so micro-learning, and we'll see in a few minutes, um, will fit for mobile devices that needs to be attractive. But they're keen on learning. They want to learn, and they need to learn. They want personalized, timely, and quality content. They want to learn anywhere, anytime. And look, only 28% want to learn from the office. 30% want to learn during breaks, and 48 um, evenings and weekends. And Eba talked about just-in-time learning, 56%. They want to be able to get a learning solution right when they need it, just in time. And they prefer learning to be you know, on the job, manager supported, different uh, aspects here. And the last slide on the modern learner, they most value ease of use and navigation. And we'll see that these are the characteristics that we're going to highlight about the design of effective microlearning, quality, and relevant and timely. And I think that's what makes microlearning very different. So that brings us to the question, if we know all that about our learners and the demands of industry, then how long is going to be a micro-learning object? Thank you, Maria Elena. Uh, it depends on who you ask. Uh, ATD, which is the Association for Talent Development, conducted a study in 2017, and they tried to quantify uh, what would be the most effective length of time for a microlearning activity. And they, they surveyed hundreds of talent, uh, talent development experts, and their consensus was that microlearning should be longer than two minutes, but shorter than five. Carl Kapp, who's going to be uh, an author, a contributing author to our book, and Robin Depelex wrote a book in 2019 uh, that uh, where they they said that the exact number is not universally agreed upon. We've seen the timeline for microlearning defined as a few seconds to as long as an hour. So uh, we typically don't think of microlearning as something that would take an hour to to do, but it can. I mean, there's no hard and fast rule that says that it can't take that long, but it can also go as short as a few seconds. It's basically as long as it needs to be. Carla Torgeson and Sue Iannan, uh, Carla is also a contributing author for our book, uh, they, they published a book in 2020, and they stated that with informal learning, learning that is not required, people will tend to gravitate to things they can consume in about four minutes or less. And J.D. Dillon, uh, who's a chief learning architect at Exonify and also has written extensively on 
uh, micro learning says that it should be as short as possible to address a specific measurable objective and fit within the audience's available time. And I think that's probably one of the best definitions in terms of the duration, how long micro learning is. It should be as short as possible, but as long as needed. Torgerson and Ion uh, take it a step further by categorizing different types of microlearning. And for each type of microlearning, they recommend a certain duration. This is through their work that they published uh, back in just recently in 2020. They identify four different uses of microlearning. The first one they defined or called pre work, and it's preparation that is usually assigned before a formal learning event. So if let's say we're going to have like this conference, this would be a perfect example. Prior to attending the conference, there could be some webinars like this one that can provide information to the participants and that, partic that information would help them uh, to be more successful in, in subsequent learning activities. They recommend that for the preparation and pre-work, the learning event should last no longer than 10 minutes. Then the second category is follow-up, and this is to boost learning. This is something that is done after a formal learning event has ended. And it could be maybe within 24 hours, or it could be within a week or 10 days after the learning event. You could send them a short email with a one minute follow-up. It could be a video or some other kind of uh, resource, but it should be very, very short and it should just highlight or emphasize the key points. The more common type of uh, micro-learning that we're familiar with is a short form learning or standalone. And Torgerson and Eon break it up into formal learning and informal learning. Through their research, they've found that for informal learning, uh, the ideal length is four minutes or less. But for formal learning, if the concepts are more complex, then up to eight minutes. And then the final uh, kind of, uh, or use of microlearning that they identify is called performance support. And they say that that can last anywhere from five seconds to five minutes. And to show how these different times uh, can, uh, can be applied, if we, they also identified five different formats for microlearning. Uh, it, range, it can range from text-based resources that might be anywhere from three to five pages in length. Those text-based resources have to be well formatted and easy to read and that can be consumed in a very short period of time or a more formal e-learning type of module that can take maybe up to eight minutes to complete uh, a video, like a YouTube video that could last anywhere from three to five minutes, an infographic, just a single page with all of the information presented visually, uh, may take anywhere from a few seconds to a minute, or a podcast. And the podcast can be something that, uh, students or learners can seek for themselves. A good example, Maria Elena and I subscribe to several podcasts that we listen to every day on our way to work. Uh, one of them is just uh, a, a simple word of the day uh, podcast, and it lasts about a minute and a half, and it basically presents a word and its origins, and it kind of really helps to build your vocabulary if you do it day after day. So there are many different types of learning uh, formats possible, and Torgerson identified the, the five most basic. As we want to cover some tips for developing effective microlearning, we want to look at what microlearning is not. It's not a tool to deliver a lot of content randomly. And I love the way Greeny puts it. Uh, she says that would misuse the small amount of time that the learners have. And it wouldn't help the content or the skills to stick. And it's not a miniature course designed for a small screen. It's not micro in the sense of 
even though we did talk about mobile learners and, and being able to access them on their devices. And I love the way um, this is put. It says, micro learning's usage patterns are entirely different from e-learning. So when we talk about usage and maximizing it, it is not these two things. Lucas Conkey, who is another author um, in our book, uh, from our, uh, in, who will contribute a chapter to our book. This is from <laughs> Interactive is upside down there, just to see if you're paying attention. <laughs> Um, it's a way to keep you engaged. Um, Lucas Conkey's chapter addresses effective design of microlearning. He talks about it being focused, just one objective, just one spoke that can go a little deeper. Simple, keep the text and layout simple, graphic. Uh, I think Eva talked about uh, you know graphic so that it engages the learner. Short, Rene shared two to six minutes. Social. Incorporate social media, discussion forum, and polls. And Eba noted earlier that one of the reasons microlearning is so popular is the technology that's available today. At the end, we'll ask you, what do you think the future of microlearning is? I think we haven't even started to touch you know, what's possible with microlearning to make it social and interactive and increase levels of engagement. And mobile adaptive, keep it simple, design, clear, and adaptable. And again, one objective, keeping it simple, is perfectly OK with microlearning. Another important uh, thing to do uh, when thinking about developing effective microlearning is to have or, uh, some kind of a framework to ensure successful implementation. And Dr. Khan developed the e-learning framework. Uh, it appeared in his very first book back in 1997, and he's written about it extensively, where he identifies these eight categories or dimensions. The first is pedagogical, the second technological, the third interface design, the fourth evaluation, the fifth management, the sixth resource support, the seventh if ethical, and the eighth institutional. If we are going to uh, embark on any type of uh, learning, the implementation of any type of learning uh, initiative, we need to look at all eight of these components. If we ignore one or two, we may still be successful, but eventually uh, it'll have to be addressed. So. It's, it's always best to start with a framework like this and consider all of the elements. And to talk about his framework, Dr. Khan uh, has a short video. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to hear this one better. So if we could play that video. OK, today I want to introduce you to this e-learning framework. Let me go through the different parts of the framework. The pedagogy. The pedagogy deals with instructional design, content design, goal analysis, audience analysis, and then move on to the technological. Technological is basically infrastructure planning, hardware, software for e-learning. Move on to interface design. Interface design, where you have the look and feel for your e-learning materials, how they would look, how one could interact with different e-learning materials. Evaluations in e-learning, you have the evaluation of in a structure and an assessment of learners. At the same time, you're going to do a comprehensive evaluation of people who are involved in developing and delivering e-learning materials. Management, you have enormous job to be done for the maintenance of e-learning material, updating them. So in this category of the framework, you have that. Resource support, you need to have a 24 hours resource support because you are online and your students all over the places, your clients all over the places, so they would like to have some kind of support, technical support. So you have to have a resource support that includes technical support and you need to have counseling support, you need to have other support services for online learning. Move on to ethical dimension. This is very important because what it has, it has geographical diversity because you have people from different parts of the world taking your courses. And now, uh, for example, 
if you have a students uh, taking a chat uh, session of a course at the person in San Francisco and it's 8 a.m. but that will be almost like 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. in DC area so you don't want to do some kind of uh, chat sessions for uh, students they are dispersed globally in different geographical location. Within the ethical dimension, you do also have uh, the accessibility issue, you have learner diversity, you have legal issues. So you can see uh, the ethical dimension is very important and cross-cultural communication. Next one is institutional. If you are an institution offering e-learning courses, you need to be very careful about digital services, academic services. One would ask the questions, if I take this class face to face, Will I get the same quality of education that I'll be getting through e-learning? So you see, that's the institutional. So you see, starting from pedagogy, technology, evaluation, management, resource support, ethical issues, and institutional issues, all this together, you put the learner that you're trying to develop the materials for, put them at the center, and ask the questions around these eight dimensions, you will see you cannot do much wrong. And on the top of that, who are other stakeholder groups, the instructor, put the instructor at the center of the model and ask the questions if you are fulfilling the instructor's needs. Then, who are the stakeholders? Institution itself, your institution should be at the center and ask the questions, what is the return on investment for institutions? So what we need to do for e-learning framework is basically put your specific audience in a specific context context at the center of the model and design the materials for your audience, audience that will bring greater return on investment of your effort. Thank you. And we will have more articles uh, related to the framework available on our learning management system. So thank you and hopefully that you will design meaningful instructions and e-learning for your audience following the eight categories of uh, this model. Thank you. And if I may jump in before you continue. Sure. If you haven't had a chance to look at uh, Dr. Khan's framework, I really, we encourage you to take a look at it. It has stood the test of time um, because, as he says, it really considers all of the factors needed for the successful implementation of any online content, whether it's a full course, a program, or as small as a, um, a snippet, you know, or a, um, a micro-learning object as we're talking about. It really takes into consideration the institutional factors for development, for implementation, the ethical factors, um, pedagogical factors, resources, and oftentimes we're focused on the pedagogical and the resources. Do we have the people, the time, and the money to develop this? What do our learners need? Uh, but without the institutional support, without looking at the ethical considerations, you know, today I was the, usually when we present, uh, I, we start with a joke. And I thought, you know, we have an international audience, and I don't know how humor, um, I mean, humor is good, but we just, you know, have to have our audience in mind and management and evaluation. Uh, those of us in educational technology and e-learning know about the instructional design process and we can't cut out that continuous evaluation of what we produce and and then they will touch on the evaluation, the assessment of micro-learning, design interface. So this framework is very powerful. It has stood the test of time because it transcends trends or strategies. It could be MOOCs, it could be micro-learning, it could be e-learning, and uh, this is a very, very good resource. And before every project, we look at the framework and we say, well, will it really fit? And we thought, micro-learning, we weren't so sure. And as we started talking, and as we started researching and looking and even talking to our contributing authors, it fits. More and more businesses are investing millions of dollars in developing uh, libraries of micro-learning objects. We were just with a uh, representative from a very big computer company, I won't mention it, and they're doing AR, virtual reality, and they already have, we can download an app on our phone for 20 US dollars, 
and have not only a way to develop virtual reality for ourselves, but it has a library of hundreds of two-minute videos that people can watch on uh, medical conditions and human anatomy, and that's micro-learning. And so it's at our fingertips, and how do we develop it effectively? The question was, uh, what instructional design model do we use? We, uh, we do teach, the one we teach our students in the educational technology program is primarily the ADDIE, but we also uh, incorporate elements from the Dick and Carey model, which is a little bit more uh, broken down. And depending on the context, sometimes we'll go ahead and use uh, a rapid prototyping model, depending on the context, the, the, the class that we're teaching. So uh, we, we try to expose our students to a variety of instructional design models. Okay, if you can back okay. up. So the next I'm sorry, let's go back yes. to the framework. Right. Um, again, we don't make any money off promoting the framework. We've just seen that it works. If you notice, it goes from institutional all the way to evaluation. Um, so this is another model that, that works. Um, so in combination, what you know, what works best for you. Uh, Renee, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, the next question that we've been uh, tackling with is how do we assess the learning in microlearning? And if we look at the various types of microlearning that exist, there, there's formal, there's informal, and then there's non-formal. But in informal learning environments where instruction tends to be instructor-led, it also tends to be instructor-assessed, and it's more programmed. In that kind of learning, uh, the assessments may be a little bit more straightforward. But in informal learning, where it's more self-directed and more self-assessed and more just-in-time, uh, the, it may be a little bit more challenging. For example, if I wanted to, let's say I got a flat tire and I wanted to know how to change a tire on my car, and I went to a YouTube video uh, to watch the steps on how to do it, I don't think I would spend any time looking at a quiz or taking a quiz after watching the video. I think that would be a waste of my time. So how would we assess learning in that kind of context? So. Uh, this is one of the challenges that we've been looking at, and we've discussed this with a lot of uh, different individuals, and we've gotten some interesting ideas. Uh, J.D. Dillon said that because microlearning is an approach to training that delivers content in short focus bites, it's that focus that also makes microlearning so measurable. It's all about starting with the end in mind through a results-focused approach to content design. So before you build the learning program, you have to know what problem you're trying to solve. So if we, if we, whenever we start to build any type of micro-learning object or event, if we think about it uh, from a results-oriented approach and design it, if we identify the objective up front, then we should be able to figure out how we might be able to assess it in either a formal or informal learning uh, event. And uh, Renee Dyer, who's also a contributor to our book, developed an acronym for remembering the four components of effective microassessments. And she came up with the acronym ITSI, which is another way of saying small or micro. And it, it consists of inventive, targeted, specific, and yielding. And let's look at each one very quickly. Inventive, micro, micro assessments should be more creative than traditional assessments. You know, if you think about the, the, the opportunity, we're, if we're developing a micro learning object or a micro learning event, we, we have uh, because it's something different and it's not uh, typically traditional in, in the way that you would think, you know, a way a course is built, why not get creative in the way we develop those assessments? 
the it should also be more sh- social and social media is particularly well suited for delivering mm-hmm. micro learning it needs to be able to capture uh engagement satisfaction relevance and the number of followers and likes that the content receives and it should be able to use traffic or download data to evaluate the popularity of the micro learning uh micro assessments should also be targeted they should target the learner knowledge in small digestible portions that are task oriented and focused they should be analogous and highly targeted and be able to yield immediate feedback they should be specific they should be con- congruent with each micro learning episode reflect the participants and measure the learning objective they should be built around the shrinking attention spans of today's learners which is something that we've been talking about and they should be able to specifically specifically address the changing workforce job requirements skills and limited time of employees if it doesn't address those things then the micro learning event won't be uh used uh the learners won't uh they won't value it enough if it doesn't address those specific needs that they have and it needs to yield uh actionable data uh that's informative and useful uh it needs to be usable and be able to inform the the developers of the micro learning event uh of future decisions it should also offer if possible learning interventions based on the data and uh dyer sums up her uh her chapter about the goal and she says if the goal is to track successful completion of a required training then the assessment might be as simple as a knowledge check with completion tracking if it's to informally share information to a non-specific audience an assessment might use the number of likes the followers comments or, sh- or shares and if the goal is to reduce process inefficiencies or increase safety then an indirect assessment of organizational data may be used to assess the usefulness of micro learning here is a video that maria elena and i developed uh back in 2017 an ipad pro for a teacher on the go it's a if you look at it it's a 6 minute video and it's had 9291 views uh of those the people that view it 61 said that they liked the video and 10 said that they didn't so that's one way that you can measure whether a micro learning object had value is if the learners found liked it and fortunately you know youtube allows for comments so you can get some input from the the viewers as well if you click let me go back if you click on the an analytics button you get even more data that can help you determine the effectiveness of your micro learning for this particular video it's resulted in 370 hours of watch time but if you look at the average duration it's 2 minutes and 23 seconds so of the 6 minute video uh the majority of, of uh, viewers only watched the the average was 2 minutes and 23 seconds so what does that tell us about the length of of uh, our micro learning objects you know we need to be very very cognizant of the learner's time and in this case maybe a 6 minute video was a little too long So just to wrap up uh if we talk about the future of micro learning go ahead Maria Elena We don't I'm sorry we're not hearing you Uh micro learning is changing the way we learn it's changing from earning degrees to developing skills from a push paradigm where content is pushed out and learners are now going to seek content and using of the internet of things a learning adapts to me instead of me having to adapt to the learning and this one was fascinating uh Hall and Hamilton are also contributors to the book it, they have a chapter called what is the future of micro learning and i think the most interesting what they have 
very uh, interesting findings, but one of them was nano learning, less than a minute to complete. It's even faster than micro learning. Uh, so we want to save time for to ask you all this question, but also to address the questions that Eva has been collecting for us throughout the session. So um, micro learning is not only here to stay; it looks like it has a future. Eva, shall we address some of the questions, or what do you all think is the future? We have about five minutes, right, Eva? Uh, so. Um Thank you very. Oh, sorry. So, thank you very much, uh, Renee and uh, Maria Elena, for this very, very comprehensive overview about uh, microlearning. And of course, also thanks a lot to Badul Khan for his contributions. Uh, we have got a lot of um, uh, comments and questions um, in the chat during the way. Uh, but before we are addressing that, um, I will also continue on the topic on microlearning. So um, I was uh, so happy I, when I, I have been in contact with Vadul Khan for some maybe 10 or 50 years by now, and I have followed his work uh, uh, very close. And actually, I have myself used uh, his models, and I like it very mu much because it is a holistic and um, approach, and it's, uh, you see the ecosystem, whether it is the e-learning. Uh, actually, I started to follow it with my work on e-learning, and then he also had it on looks and now on microlearning. And um, can I have my slides, please, um, uh, Dora? Thank you so much. Uh, so uh, myself, uh, besides uh, that very short presentation I had about my what I, my roles is that. Um, I have been working with microlearning myself since around 2000, 2002. And I will just uh, share briefly uh, how um, I came into this area. And that was with a European project uh, within the geographical information system. And we um, came across the, the issue of microlearning. And we saw the idea that we developed uh, microlearning uh, units from two to three minutes up to two weeks. I don't know that that is not microlearning, but we had the microlearning units, and we had the courses for two weeks, for two months, and up to a full master. And exactly what you were saying uh, in your presentation, Maria Elena and uh, then Renee, uh, you can uh, combine the microlearning units even with uh, up to a full master course, as we did in this uh, geographical information uh, system program. It was really, really interesting, and that is what what you can do. And what, what I would like to continue with, um, microlearning is really, really a um, uh, hot topic for the moment. As, uh, as we all have pointed out, the labor market is changing. And there is so rapid uh, changes in the knowledge uh, environment and um, all these kind of things, and the use of social media, the use of internet, and everything is accessible. But uh, we need to do it smarter, and uh, just for me, and in just for time, to get it more personalized. And that is also why it is so important to um, see microlearning and OER together. OER is open education resources, because many of those microlearning snippets or units or modules is ideal to have uh, as OER, open education resources, and open available for all. And to have that in mind already when you are developing the signing the microlearning units. And you can see many similarities about how we look at OER and how we look at microlearning. Um, we all, many of us know that um, UNESCO adopted the OER recommendations on the 25th of November 2019. And now they define open educational resources like this. I think you can read yourself. In the recommendations, they also stated five um, clear recommendations how we can now go from awareness raising 
about open education resources to actions to implementation. And here's also where uh, the approach of microlearning come in. Because we need to build capacity of stakeholders to create, access, and reuse, adapt, and redistribute uh, OER. And uh, there is microlearning, a very, very good way to do that. But also to develop and support policies. Uh, then we can go back to the model, uh, the framework by Badr Khan that you need to have this holistic perspective. You can, it's not just the unit as, uh, itself, it's also about evaluation, it is about the infrastructure, etc. All the things which we are an umbrella. Uh, but also to encourage the use of OER. Uh, so one of the questions, for example, was about what's happened with the presentations? Um, maybe we have to go back to my presentation, Dora. Um, well, anyway, uh, I, one of the questions in the in the chat was about um, accessibility. If that was also for the, the disabilities and disability persons, <coughs> and um, accessibility is for all, and that means also that we need need to um, develop and design those resources, the micro learning uh, resources, uh, the OERs, so they are available for all. And also to uh, create um, sustainable models. And that goes again back to the use of microlearning. You need to have a system which uh, can integrate the use of microlearning and to also, when you use it, for example, for formal learning. So there are incentives for teachers, for academics, to work on the issue of microlearning and with open education resources. And of course, to facilitate international corporations. And that goes uh, to all the four other areas. And there again, we can all collaborate together. Uh, you don't need to uh, decide to create all those resources yourself. <sighs> uh, you can work, uh, nowadays also you can work and collaborate all over the world to get the international approach of a special, specific topic, for example, uh, for a microlearning uh, uh, topic. You can work with international collaborators. So I see that there are many, many parallels uh, with microlearning and the use uh, and development of OER and how we can need to work together with that. Um, what is also very good with those recommendations is that now there, there is a monitoring system. And I will not go through that in details. But you know, it's one thing to develop things, but it's another thing to, to monitoring it. And there again, we can use the model of a uh, uh, Khan the framework, because you saw evaluation was one of the parts as well. Um, this week, actually, on the, um, Monday, it was the 2nd, of, um, the 2nd of March, UNESCO launched this dynamic correlation for UNESCO uh, to implement uh, implementation of UNESCO OER recommendation. And that is a, a number of organizations who are working together now how to integrate and implement uh, all those recommendations which I just have mentioned within the member countries. And there again, we need to have the think about microlearning and microlearning either as standalones or to be integrated in formal learning. But it also was mentioned in the, in the questions, it is both for, for formal learning, informal learning, and non-formal learning. Um, I also have some slides uh, on microlearning from maybe another perspective, but more or less the same. So I will not go through that uh, too much again, because that has already been uh, been um, so well explained by uh, Renee and by uh, Maria Elena. But it is said that uh, it's one of the most effective forms of learning and training. Because it is uh, motivating, it is just in time and just for me and used to be personalized. And people, when people are motivated, they learn. Uh, 
<laughs> and as also was um, mentioned by Maria Elena, was um, the rise of the, and also by myself in the beginning, the rise of the of mobile learning approach. Everyone has mobiles nowadays, or so iPads or uh, mobile desktops. So it goes very well with with the mobile learning approach, and that was also last this week, for example, with the UNESCO conference in Paris, which actually was cancelled due to the Corona virus, but. Um, but mobile learning is the way people learn today, both um, for informal learning, formal learning, and non-formal learning. And it's always the, more or less the, the first choice. And you can also combine the, the micro-learning ap approach with uh, the Lego uh, system approach. You pick the pieces which suit you, depending what you like to achieve. Uh, what you like to achieve, when you like to, uh, to do it, and uh, also depending on your pre-understanding or on the, the demands you are facing. I love that metaphor, Emma. So uh, the Lego system is, I <laughs> so I didn't go piece by piece or different kind of pieces. So we can also get a package. I mean, as uh, I said, uh, for example, you can develop the micro-learning uh, uh, within a course. And that is more like it may be a package. But you can also encourage the, the learners and students to pick their own uh, box, depending what they would like to achieve. And that I think uh, we have to think, rethink about the education system because what we do very much now is to offer things instead of see what is needed, what do people need, and how can they pick and choose. And I think that is really the, 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 the huge challenge uh, education is facing today because it is going from uh, offering things to uh, what are the learners' needs, and how can that be be offered and served in the best way? So the micro learning and the Lego and the mobile learning approach goes very well hand in hand. Uh, this one I will also skip. Uh, but again, it was also, was also pointed out uh, earlier on by Maria Elena and and um, Rene is that micro-learning units can come in different kind of media, and that is exactly, again, about OER. They also come within different kind of media. It can be texts, it can be images, photos, illustrations, videos. Uh, there was a comment here, for example, by the video from uh, Badal Khan that was a very good example about micro-learning. In a very, uh, some minutes, just in some minutes, he explained exactly, I mean, on a brief perspective at least, what micro-learning is about. And it was engaging, it was illustrative, it was uh, motivating, and uh, I suppose and hope that we all would like to learn more about it because it was really some, something which was touching. So micro-learning, as well as OER, come in different kind of medias. And I also think we have to shift from, I mean, everything is so text-based in education. We have to shift to more, um, um, images, videos, uh, you mentioned podcasting, uh, games, um, gamification of learning, etc. <laughs> so there are, as has been pointed out already, a lot of benefits. It is fast. It is more, uh, more affordable for the learner. It is flexible. And uh, again, it is, uh, learners find it more engaging and it boosts knowledge retention, and then not at least it gives learners a lot of more freedom. And when people have freedom, they can take responsibilities, and they can be owner of their own learning, and they can um, orchestra their own learning pathways in a much better way. But <clears throat> for doing that, the education system has to change. And that's exactly why I wanted, really wanted to have this topic on the agenda for the Open Educational Week, about microlearning because I think it's so important and so uh, interesting and it really, uh, although it has been, long, been along for many, many years, it uh, is a shift how we consider learning and education. <coughs> so, um, of course, one can, uh, we have uh, all pointed out a lot of benefits and um, why my, microlearning uh, uh, are efficient and why it is motivating. But of course, are there any limitations? Um, I don't have any answers on that uh, exactly. Of course, I have some doubts and uh, 
things, but I will leave it rather open because I think that can be also an issue to discuss. Uh, what I would like to uh, point out is a very interesting initiative from the European Commission from the EASME and the Digital Growth. And in December, uh, sorry, in, in September uh, 2019, they launched this report, report about online training and promoting open online learning in the workforce in Europe. It has been a two-year project, and I have myself been an evaluator and an um, expert in the group. And they um, mapped what is going on uh, at working places in Europe uh, about online learning. And um, it, is, uh, it is a very interesting report. And um, they found that, of course, um, it is um, a huge diversity, a huge diversity in Europe, and a huge diversity in, in, in the labor market, of course. But what they found out is that nowadays uh, companies can't you know, send people for courses. First of all, it costs too much, much to send them out. A second, they have to pay for someone who can replace for them, replace them, and there's a lot of other um, bad things uh, going uh, on with that. And when people coming back from a course, you know, it is very difficult to um, come back to the working place and to engage other people because they are already so busy with everything else. So there's a huge need of working places today, and that is one of the conclusions with this report, and that, that's why I wanted to point it out for you for this webinar. Uh, there is a lot of recommendations, and one of the recommendations is that micro-learning need to take a larger and more deep um, approach in working places uh, today. And that's why uh, there need to be a cooperation with different kind of stakeholders, universities, for example, and the labor market. <coughs> um, so not everyone need to re you know reinvent the wheel all the time, but um, professional continuing education nowadays need to uh, be more um, pers personal personalized. It need to be individualized. It need to be um, again just for me and just for time learning, and it need to come in small pieces, so people can, uh, as you were pointed out as well, Renee, in your, one of your slides, how you can adapt. Immediate, more or less immediately what you have learned, not next week or not for a test, but immediately here and now in your work. Um, so that was a very, very um, interesting result. And now this, um, um, uh, both not just the report, but the work from this project is circulating now in Europe. And um, actually, we had an Eden uh, webinar uh, some weeks ago where the project manager uh, presented the, the results uh, from this project. And uh, if you have an interest in that, that is recorded and it is available to uh, Eden's uh, web page. It was actually the 12th of uh, February, so just yes, some weeks ago. Uh, the same, um, the same um, uh, AATME and the digital growth, and uh, together with the Price Waterhouse, who have done the, the studies and the reports, uh, have also just uh, launched their report on skills for industry curriculum guidelines 4.0. And again, uh, the study they have done, a two-year study, is that curricula again uh, need to be uh, re reconsidered, and that the issue of microlearning is also raised very, very much in this report how we consider the curricula. You know, ordinary curriculums, curriculums are rather boring, and you know, a lot of you know, uh, <laughs> high-level uh, uh, issues, but not related to the labor market, and not related how people are learning in this rapid uh, speed of, of how knowledge is, uh, is um, uh, transformed out nowadays. Uh, this report came out just uh, now in the beginning of this year. So uh, you see, um, from both those projects uh, on the um, European level, um, microlearning uh, fill a very, very important role um, for the learner and for the uh, labor market and for for to uh, be a competitive um, uh, region uh, in in the. On the but also to be to be competitive uh, in the knowledge development 
either at a working place or at a society, but not at least uh, for the learner themselves, because when learners take the, the, the ownership, then they are more mot motivated, then they are more motivated to learn, and when they are that, they can take more an active part in the development of the society, and for themselves, of course. So with that, I will um, leave um, the rest of the time for the discussions we can have now, and a lot of questions have been raised uh, during this one and a half hour. Uh, I can well, maybe start about the issue about, um, let me see. Thank you for the questions. They're amazing. There was an issue about is, is it uh, is micro learning uh, just for for um, non formal learning? There was an issue about that, but I think we have maybe have raised that question uh, um, all of us. But maybe you can reflect a bit more about that, uh, Renee and Maria Elena. Could you repeat the question? How you how you. The question was about is uh, micro learning just for non formal learning? And I think we have raised the, the, the discussion about it, but maybe you can elaborate a bit more how you see how it can be combined with formal learning, non formal okay. learning. Well, I think that it could be applied to all uh, formal, informal, and non formal learning experiences. One of the best math books I've ever seen. Uh, my daughter took a college algebra class that was online. And in that book, it had, uh, when they were teaching the different uh, algebraic concepts, they had these short videos where they would show you a worked sample of a question. And the video was only about one or two minutes in length. And then they, sh and they had several little videos like that at with different levels of completion of that worked sample. A worked sample is where you guide the learner from a novice, uh, where they don't know anything, where they're introduced to the concept. Uh, and maybe in the next example, it's partially worked. And then the next example is a little bit further. And then it eventually it gets to the point where the learner is, is doing the, uh, the activity or solving the problem completely unassisted. So it, it it was a really interesting way to do it. And all of the videos that they had in the book were about one to two minutes, specifically about one simple or single concept or idea. I could see how an entire course could be built that way. So in a, in a formal learning environment, I, I see micro learning as a, as a way that could be integrated into any type of uh, uh, formal, you know, academic course or subject. In professional development, uh, it should be something, there are some things that are mandatory, you know, every employee in, in an organization, for example, here at, at our university, uh, there are maybe a dozen to, uh, to 15 different trainings that we have to uh, complete every year and they range in length from about five to ten minutes in length and uh, those are mandatory so we have to do them and um, that's different from where you're in a situation where you want to learn a skill and you know you just go and find the resource to teach yourself how to do it that would be a more informal and that could occur in, in a structured environment if I'm at work and I need to know how to do perform an operation on a spreadsheet, I can just go find a YouTube video to do it. So I see uh, micro learning being applicable in every type of learning situation. Yes, yes that is also my, um, my understanding uh, of it. Uh, and um, as I said, you can, it depends how you combine it. It can be standalone. And also the example I gave from this um, my micro learning course is up to full master, and you said also in one of your slides that you can have it uh, as the flipped learning uh, model. You can have micro learning units uh, maybe before uh, going into deeper discussions when you come to the classroom, or you can have it maybe afterwards. 
So it depends on how you can combine it. There is an interesting question about uh, the social aspect. Uh, I mean, how to ensure the social part besides use, using social uh, social networks? Um, I don't really exactly know know how you mean by that, Isabella. But um, maybe we can um, I think discuss I it a bit. The social aspect yeah, of I think learning. I understand using. the question. Uh, I think yes, I understand the ahead. question, since we're talking about these small bits that we consume independently and quickly, how is that collaborative? How do we engage people together in conversations? They almost seem independent by their very nature and definition. Uh, Christopher's talking about asynchronously, right? That's asynchronous learning. Um, I don't know. Any, any ideas out there? I think yeah. as we... As we talked about the future, I think that's where a lot of the conversation is going to be. And Eva, you shared earlier that micro learning is booming based on the technologies we have. And I think there are technologies right now that we don't, we can't even conceive. Um, so I know it's not answering the question, yeah. but uh, you know, maybe creating communities of learners, well, the social one networks. Thing, Go ahead. Anna. One thing that I have seen. Well, that's, that's where I was going, uh, yep. creating these communities uh, through social media where people can go and there could be these micro learning events or objects uh, that are delivered and made accessible through social platforms where people can then, uh, you know, contribute and, or chime in on a topic or an idea. I see that often in Facebook groups uh, that are dedicated to a specific topic. So that yeah. might be one. I think it is. I think it's important to. I mean, it is an important question and issue. And um, of course, I understand what you mean, Isabella. It's not that, but um, um, in one way, I wanted to be a bit, you know, um, provocative because I mean, quite often when we're talking about, although micro learning is a new, not a new thing, but when we're talking about new aspects, for example, and in this, this is the case, uh, micro learning. We used to, to think about it, how can we have that in the, the system we have today, in the house we already are in, so to say, instead of thinking outside the box or with no box at all, because we are, education is changing, the world is changing, everything is so, so much changing. So we need to uh, see new ways how we can deal with it. Of course, it is a very important question, how to deal with uh, socialization and learning collaboratively, I mean, this kind of thing. It's important, but how can we do that in maybe more innovative ways, new ways? And you also raised the issue about um, artificial intelligence and uh, augmented reality, I mean, all those kind of things, and we, robotization, I mean, um, <clears throat> we, we shall not uh, uh, limit ourselves to the old system. And that was also a question about earlier on about uh, assessment and examination, and again, <laughs> we need to also reconsider the way how we assess and how the way how we examine our learners and what we get, get credits for. And that is also why, for example, this open batch uh, system and approach has become very, very popular because many uh, companies nowadays are, of course, asking for if people have a degree in engineering or nursing or whatever, but they are also very much asking for this kind of um, more um, non-formal uh, <coughs> um, performance and the learning which people have done, more volunteer work, if that, we, we used to call them 21st century, uh, century competences, like problem solving, like leadership, like um, collaboration, uh, I mean a lot of this kind of um, issues which we used to to um, do in our daily life and to which we have to, to deal with at the working places. And that is also why people, uh, companies very much are asking for, for example, open batches. Have you taken part in this kind of things? Have you, are you active in some kind of um, uh, non-formal learning? Or are you doing some kind of volunteer work? Um, so we have to, to uh, broaden our perspective. And that was also one of the reasons why I wanted to brought micro-learning on the agenda for this um, webinar on the, during the Open Education Week and uh, the webinar hosted by Eden, because I think we need to discuss it uh, much more and um, also in a much more innovative way. And I think uh, really UNA and Maria and Helena have um, really brought us 
some steps further on. Uh, we are really, really looking forward when the book is coming out. <laughs> yeah. uh, we, we've, so we have. We have some uh, five minutes uh, left. Um, are there some more questions uh, which we have to address? Um, I think here's a um, um, learning and um, um, empathetic, empathetic. Learning is more humanistic if students are sharing their experiences, yes. Yes, of course, learning is uh, both individual and uh, it's uh, social and it is uh, collaborative. Um, and we need to have uh, many of those aspects um, into consideration. And I think that is also why this framework by Badal Khan and uh, the continuous work you're doing, Rene and Maria Elena, it's very important to see this uh, ecosystem uh, in learning processes. Isabella was talking about how to ensure the social part besides using social networks. Um, it's, it is a challenging thing uh, if, if, uh, if micro learning is just in time, uh, the chances of being able to be together at the same time to discuss it may not be possible. But if we look at the example of how YouTube videos are developed, you know, you can you have you create you create the video, and then there's an ongoing conversation in the discussion section. If you intentionally ask at the end of of your video, so uh, a last question know, for what are your thoughts, or Sorry. you know, if you have some probing questions at the end of the video, then you can get people to engage in a conversation that goes beyond just that two or three minute video, and you'll see you know the dates of how, when people are participating in. And this could be done for just about any type of micro learning object. It could be uh, on a, on a e-learning module that has a discussion that it's ongoing. I often see I, a lot of value in those. When I, when I want to learn a skill, oftentimes I'll go to these user groups online and I'll search the comments because someone will probably have had the same experience or issue that I had, and you you'll see conversation threads that specifically address those. I have a, a last question for you, Renee, and for Maria Elena. Um, you have given us a very very comprehensive um, overview on the issue of micro learning. So, uh, for all of us who are believers and would like to continue uh, working on this issue. Uh, what kind of advice will you give us? To can never stop learning uh, is one thing, because we, <laughs> we're by no means experts ourselves. We're all learning this uh, as we go. And, you know, from every learning experience we create, we should be able to learn something ourselves. So as you create learning, e-learning experiences, micro-learning experiences, you know, learn from those experiences yourself and, and so that the next one you build will be a little bit better. One thing that I'm taking into consideration is maybe a six minute YouTube video is a little too long. So maybe I'll make the next video two to three minutes, which seem to be the average. Yeah. Don't be afraid Thank you. to jump in. More than likely you're already creating uh, products, learning products that can apply and can be cut down or modified. Um, collaborate, learn from others. Um, sometimes I feel I have to do it all alone, and that's not true. You know, we have graphic designers that uh, it doesn't have to be expensive. One of the points of one of the authors of the book is it doesn't have to be expensive. Uh, there are people out there willing to collaborate and uh, start small with us. Uh, so, thank you very much, and thank you so much, uh, Rene uh, Kobali and Maria Kobali and um, Badal Khan for joining us for this uh, very, very interesting and fruitful uh, uh, webinar uh, on behalf of Eden during the Open Educational Week 2020. And thanks a lot for all of you who have uh, participated in this webinar and for all your questions, your comments, your links, and everything. And um, 
keep uh, staying um, within the discussion and the conversation. Uh, our next webinar for EDAN is uh, our regular uh, webinar from the EDAN NAT Network of Academic Professionals, and that is on the uh, let me see, the 18th of March, and it is about organizing digital conferences, experiences, and opportunities. Uh, I put the link in the chat, and uh, please also uh, join us at the 29th Eden Annual Conference in uh, Timisoara, Romania, 21-24 June 2020. Uh, thanks a lot to the Eden Secretariat for all your support and help with this uh, webinar, especially Dora. Thank you very much. So, um, keep going and um, keep uh, going with the micro-learning. We all learn together. Thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. Bye -bye. Thank you, and hopefully we'll be able to do this again. Thank you. Bye-bye.